think about it this in terms of psychological capital mm -hmm. that you're really dialed in to recognize that those moments and to to go after them and at the same time to notice to note the days that you don't have it that you're not making good decisions and to limit your downside and to prioritize recovery because a, a, a poor decision wipes out a lot of really good decisions and the results of any given day really don't matter that's chris sparks up next on the All Things Risk podcast. Welcome and welcome back to the All Things Risk podcast. I'm Ben Catania, your host, and it hasn't been that long. This is our second episode in three days, and I wanted to get this one out for a while. It was recorded before the coronavirus lockdowns. And I didn't want to wait another week because it's such a great conversation. And now is a wonderful time to release this conversation. My guest is Chris Sparks. Chris is a professional poker player. He was among the top 20 ranked poker players for online poker in the world. And it is this experience of making just an exponential number of decisions that Chris has taken and applied and applies to help people in their work and for their personal growth. And if you've listened to a couple of our other previous episodes with Annie Duke and with Alec Torelli, you will know that poker is a game that mimics life because it involves decision-making under uncertainty. And Chris has taken what he's learned in poker and his academic background, which by the way, is in marketing and psychology, and founded a company called The Forcing Function, which is dedicated to empowering the next generation of entrepreneurship. And in this episode, Chris shares a wealth of very useful techniques to improve performance and deal with uncertainty that even though we recorded this before the pandemic, right now are incredibly useful. And they include decision-making techniques, what to do when things go wrong, why we are all mental athletes and the importance of mental training, what the World Economic Forum in Davos is like, which Chris had just returned from when we recorded this, and a ton more of great things. So let's get into it. Here is Chris Sparks. Chris, welcome to the All Things Risk podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on and love talking about the the parallels between poker and life and all that good stuff. This is going to be a lot of fun, I'm sure. Super excited to be here, Ben. Thanks. So to kick things off, would be great to get a little bit of your background as to who you are, what you do. And I'm always curious, like, how did, how does somebody become a professional poker player? How does that happen? <laughs> That's a, yeah, it's a funny one. I, I, I always like to say uh, you're become a professional poker player when you just stop working. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 you know, there's a lot of people who label themselves as such. It's not necessarily a label that, uh, means that someone is successful. It just means that that's the primary way that they spend their time. For me, taking the plunge somewhat happened because I was just more successful at it as, in terms of economically than I was at other things. The quick background that I'll give, um, I've always been a games player, was really into, you know, real-time strategy games, card games growing up, and uh, stumbled upon poker just from, you know, my other games friends say, hey, there's this other game you can play, but you could actually make money at it. And, you know, this was when I was, you know, 16 or so. And so real money was playing in 5,000 person free roll tournaments, right? Entering for free where first prize might be a hundred bucks, but you know, it was a lot of money at the time and would stay up, you know, all hours of the night, 12 hours straight trying to win that. And the kind of the big transition happened when I entered into college, um, you know, so much of luck is timing and, you know, market cycles. And as I start college, poker is on TV all the time. So this is 2004, 
Chris Moneymaker has just won the World Series of Poker. Whole card cams are a thing, making poker going, taking poker from one of the least interesting things to watch to one of the most interesting, at least, you know, at the time, if you're a millennial male. And if you wanted to spend time with other guys in the dormitory in the frat house, like what you did on weekends was play poker. And so just my natural gaming background gave me a big edge in these games. And I started to very quickly become, you know, relatively successful, Um, you know, paid off my tuition pretty early, started off playing tournaments, had some early five figure scores there, Um, won a large 7,000 person tournament right after I graduated for 135,000 and then decided to transition into playing cash games. So the difference between cash game and a tournament, obviously tournament, you put down one buy-in and then you compete over a prize pool where the majority of the prize pool is at the top. Um, Cash game, you are betting the money in front of you. Um, We call it table stakes. You can only bet what you have in front of you. And so you can get up and walk away at any given time. Primary advantage of playing cash games is that because you have an immediate realization versus playing for a very top-heavy power law um, prize pool, that you can have more consistent earnings. And especially at the time I was playing online, I started off playing 24 to 30 games at a time, which means I was having thousands of decisions per hour. And Holy cow. to get in, <laughs> get in quite a lot of experience in a short period of time where you had, you know, my generation of players, you know, by the time I was 23, I had played more hands of poker than guys who had sat in their casino their entire lives. Mm. And so, I mean, that's really the key to improvement speed in anything is the tightness of feedback loops where I'm making a decision and I'm getting immediate feedback thousands of times per hour on whether the decision I made was correct in terms of, you know, the result was within the range of possibilities that I had projected. So this kind of goes on during during college at paid tuition. But, you know, I'm a Midwest guy. I'd always wanted to make television commercials and so never really considered going pro. I accepted a job um, with Ford Motor Company out of college. And again, the 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 luck of timing um, joining uh, the auto industry in the year of 2008 was uh, was not the best hmm. time. And the uh, week before I was supposed to start, Ford goes on a government mandated hiring freeze. So I'm sitting in Detroit, don't know anyone. All the time, all of a sudden, I have all this free time. I was a bit of an overachiever in college, and so hey, well, this hobby that you know paid my tuition, what would it look like if I did this all the time? And so all of a sudden, you know, poker became an 80-hour-a-week job for me, and I started making what my annual salary would have been on a monthly basis. From that, I, I parlayed into a a consultancy um, where I I coach other players who were up and coming as well as an investment arm where I find, you know, promising players and back them. You know, I cover their downside in exchange Mm. for a percentage of their winnings. Move out to Los Angeles into kind of a co-working house with four other high stakes professional players. And before you know it, 2011, I'm ranked in the top 20 online players in the world for cash games. Fast forwarding a little bit, April 2011, uh, the day we call Black Friday, Online poker is shut down by the feds. That's a whole story in itself. Money laundering, bank fraud, all that stuff by the sites. I have half of my net worth seized, get some of it back three years later. And the the journey since then has kind of been a wandering of how can I apply all these lessons that I learned on the way to becoming one of the world's best poker players to you know helping others. Um, I'm very passionate about empowering entrepreneurship helping more people put things into the world. I also really enjoy working with active investors um, who make up a big part of my clientele along with company executives. You know, what are the commonalities behind making excellent decisions with imperfect information? That's essentially what poker was. So I got back into poker, kind of got lured out of uh, an early retirement in 2017. And so I kind of split my time 50-50 these days between my consultancy, the forcing function, and playing high stakes poker online. Wow. Oh, there's a lot there. And uh, I guess before we dive into some of this stuff, what did you want to, to do or be when you were when you were growing up? Did you have uh, clearly online poker is a new career. So perhaps you, you, you did uh, have some inkling that this was an option, but w- did you have any other dreams or ambitions or things that you wanted to, to do with your life? Yeah, the 
I would say if I had a thread that ties everything that I've done together, it's understanding people. I've always been very fascinated by people, um, what makes us tick, and particularly the way that we make decisions. So my dream from basically when I graduated uh, high school through to the point that I you know, decided that maybe I should pursue this whole poker thing full time was I wanted to make television commercials. So all of my college involvement, internships, the job that I took at Ford being, you know, one of the largest advertisers in the world was all geared towards I want to make commercials for TV. I, I, I find the medium so fascinating. And how do you convey a message through the visual medium that causes people to alter their behavior subconsciously mm. essentially you know it's like tv commercials are essentially brand advertising you're reminding the customer that you exist and you're associating your brand with some intangible value right you could see every commercial as a mini movie in that the brands are interchangeable there's some sort of value as family or friendship or success or trustworthiness character like then you just kind of stick in your brand at the end and you create that association where by buying our product, you will achieve this intangible value in your life. And I found the, the mechanisms behind that so fascinating hmm. and, you know, naturally translated into what I was doing at the poker table where playing a poker hand is telling a story that you get the other player to, you kind of nudge them into making decisions that are beneficial for you. And so, yeah, I've, I've always found this idea of, you know, what makes us tick? How do we make decisions? How do we, how do we behave and how do we get others to behave in ways that are beneficial to us? Um, you know, incredibly fascinating. Mm, yeah. What did you study when you went to college? I called it consumer behavior. Okay. Um, essentially, it was it was a double major of marketing and psychology, okay. and I found the, uh, the psychology courses imminently more useful mm. than all the business courses. I, I don't know, if, other than the you know the capstone courses where you know you're debating Harvard cases. I don't know if any of those courses really had any usefulness. Uh, sorry if any, you know, college <laughs> students or Ohio State alumni are listening to this. It's just, you know, by the time something makes it into a textbook, and particularly when it comes to marketing, it's it's overrated. I don't find that many of those old principles kind of hold water. It was kind of interesting um, when I when I went into the startup world, you know, I joined uh, a company full time as their their marketer because I wanted to see what it's like on the inside, what you can, you can only really learn some lessons through experience. You know, what are the mm. actual problems that a quickly growing business solves? And I naively thought that having a four year degree in marketing would be good preparation for that and quickly realized that I knew nothing. <laughs> um, but it's, 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 it's good to learn that early on. Yeah. That, that, there's a, there's a lot of good stuff there and we could dive into a few things, but one of the, the areas that I, I thought we could explore a little bit here is when you mention you like the the idea of stories and how our our brains work and and those kinds of things and that's a really interesting set of tools and expertise that that I think you have developed and conversely you know you you also poker is a as far as I understand it, uh, also very mathematically driven game, right? There's there's odds of you know of of uh, having a su successful hand, and so you've got to apply some kind of logical, rational, calculated reasoning. But at the same time, you've you've just talked about how our how our brains work and our psychological traps and and those those kinds of things. That's a very powerful combination of those those two types of skill sets. I'm wondering if you could. Talk about that a little bit more around how you apply those those two things in the game of poker, and then perhaps we can talk about how you apply those skills in the work that you do with with your your clients. Absolutely. So, at a high level, poker is a game of equities, and so where where probabilistic thinking, where mathematics comes into play in poker, is knowing you know what your chances of winning the hand are at any given mm -hmm. time. The problem is humans are the big blind spot in the system, and it, it's a large unknown variable that you have to solve for. And so it doesn't help 
to know what your chances of winning the hand are if you have no idea what your opponent has because success is relativistic. You know, you don't need to have a great hand. You just need to have a hand that's better than your opponent's. Mm -hmm. And keeping in mind that many situations in poker are very, very close where, you know, someone might write it down it down to a coin flip, but you're actually 55 percent to win and pushing those edges, you know, recognizing them and over millions of hands in a lifetime, those edges, you know, add up to millions of dollars. Mm. And so being the, the calibration that occurs all happens on the psychological side where you're you're constantly using you know bayesian type calculations to determine what your opponent is trying to accomplish what is their current state of mind what is the story that they're telling and does it make sense right so in poker we have the concept of a range you know richard feynman has this classic story where he's he's listening to a, another scientist idea and he's creating a, a visual model in his head and he's adding on all the pieces, right? He has a ball and he adds fuzz onto the ball and he adds spikes onto the ball. And at a certain point, the ball falls to the floor because the story doesn't add up. One of the pieces of the model that he's building is, is inconsistent. And that's essentially what, we're, mm -hmm. what you're doing as a poker player when you're both when you're when you're bluffing when you're trying to get your opponent to fold thus you know i have a stronger hand than you but also when you're feigning weakness that i you have a strong hand and you're trying to draw them in is you're creating a story that is consistent and so a range is you have all of the hands that your opponent could have and that range narrows as the hand goes on right you have these compounding probabilities so i raise pre-flop from a certain position and that that limits the number of hands i could have down and then the flop comes and i either bet or i check or i raise and then the turn and then the river and you have all of these adding probabilities up and the story that i'm telling like needs to be consistent right a hand mm -hmm. that i'm representing needs to remain on the ball in that range that I can have given the decisions I made throughout that hand. And so this understanding of, of stories and how we construct them, how they remain consistent is really critical in poker because if you're able to tell a good story, you can get your opponent to do what you want them to do. You can get them to fold on command. You can get them to call when they shouldn't. And you, you kind of manipulate their perception. You know, one of my favorite one of my favorite models for decision making is the OODA loop. So okay. the the part of the OODA loop is orient, right? You observe, orient, decide, act. And so orienting means you're take you're constantly taking your models of the world, your maps, and matching them up to the territory. Mm -hmm. But if you're someone who's able to control the narrative, your opponent's model is continuously out of date. And so in, in UDA terms, you get inside of their loop in that they're acting on an incorrect model of the world. The, the way that they think they, things are was true maybe five minutes ago was no longer the case. Um, a classic scenario in poker is you bluff them, you bluff them, you bluff them, and then you anticipate when they're going to counterpunch you, but you've already adjusted to quote unquote tighten your ranges so that you're much more likely to have it next time just at the point that they react, right? You anticipate their reaction and, and you're already there. Mm -hmm. you're, being, you're a level ahead of them. They, you know that they're going rock eventually and you've already changed paper. It's, it's, it's really kind of cool from a game theoretic perspective that this ability to tell as well as read stories and the nuance in, in between the lines gives you a large edge in any pursuit where there's someone on the other side of the trade. Okay. There's a, there's a lot of good stuff here and it's deep as well and very, your, your words are, all, are very measured. So they, you can tell they come from experience, but for those people who are listening maybe and that either don't play the game of poker, and then this is really cool stuff. So how did you learn to do that, particularly with online poker, right? Because you don't, you're not, you don't see your opponents and, and maybe that, I, that might be an interesting place to start. You perhaps aren't in front of them and maybe not reading body language and maybe that's helpful i don't i don't know is that let's maybe start there is the fact that you're able to iterate a number of hands 
online, do you consider that to have been an advantage in your, your development of these techniques? A hundred percent. I mean, intuition is just internalized experience. And mm -hmm. so if you've seen a certain number of hands, you become very attuned to the signal rather than the noise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, classic consciousness studies say we're taking in millions of bits of information, but we're only consciously aware of a couple dozen. Mm -hmm. And so imagine, you know, these days I'm playing 12 games at a time. And so I have 70 players who I'm actively keeping track of their state of mind. But of all the things that are happening on the table, right? All these hands that are taking place simultaneously, only a few things actually matter. But having the right mental models in place uh, allows you to be attuned to what are the things that are happening that actually affect your decision and what is just noise. Mm -hmm. And that's where amateurs go astray in poker or in any pursuit is that they're attuned to the wrong information. Online is an interesting case because, as you said, you can't see the players, right? So an important piece of information is gone, right? When I'm sitting across from someone at a poker table, I not only have character things that I can use to calibrate on, you know, who they are as a person, right? What they're wearing, what's their posture, you know, what's their what's their mood, you know, how are they talking to others? What are the topics of conversation? What are they drinking? There's like so many factors that are at play, but not seeing someone having that source of information cut off does not mean that there's not still someone else on the other side of the screen, right? It's mm -hmm. there's there's just a technological intermediary that's blocking us, but I can still suss out aspects of their personality, of their state of mind. It's just a little bit more noisy. So the speed with which they bet, what they type into the chat box, what their screen name, what their avatar is, and primarily their patterns. And so I can make a large adjustment to my model of the player, seeing them play a certain, playing a single hand in a way that's super unorthodox. So if they play a hand very passively, I can update my model of them as someone who's likely to play passive in similar situations. And vice versa, if I see someone who's taking an unnecessary risk, they're, they're bluffing in a spot where I'm unlikely to fold, I can assume they're going to perform the same way in similar situations. And the, the meta advantage there is once I know they have a tendency, I nudge them into those situations where I understand their tendency, I multiply that edge. And so that's that's a key thing that a lot of people miss when they shift from live play to online play is all the signals are still there that you just have to dig a little bit deeper. Mm. You still have that advantage of recognizing the pattern and exploiting it. Okay, and how, how do you nudge someone into or based on their tendencies? So imagine that we're playing a hand, mm -hmm. um, the two of us, Ben, and the last hand that we played, I'm going to oversimplify here. We, we got to the river, all of the draws have missed, and you make a big bluff, and I call it. Mm -hmm. I say I just, I just happened to have a big hand, and I was trapping. Right? So I call you, you feel a little bit dumb because you made a big bluff into me, and I had it, mm -hmm. and you rebuy in. And so... I'm already thinking about how are you going to adjust in the future. Okay. And so I'm using the information I have about you to predict how you're going to adjust, right? So in that scenario, certain player types are going to tighten up, right? I just look silly in front of people making this big bluff. They're going to think I'm a bluffer. Mm -hmm. Thus, I'm going to wait till I have a hand. And so I can take advantage of that. One, knowing that the next time you make a big bet, you're you're more likely uh, on average going to have a hand, but also that you're going to shrink back from ambiguous spots, right? If it's close, I know that I'm more often than not can pick up the pot. Okay. That's that's one reaction you could have. Another reaction you could have, this would be more of a level one reaction, is oh, now you know, now I'm down, I'm losing, I just made a big bluff, I gotta get that money back, I gotta show him. And so now I know you're going to be a little bit more risk-seeking, right? We tend to be risk-seeking when we're losing due to loss aversion. I'm sure listeners are familiar with that literature. Um, and so I'm going to try to set you up to bluff again, sort of keep the ball in the air, give you opportunities by underplaying my hand, right? Seeming that I'm a little bit weaker than I actually am in order to encourage you to put more money into the pot, to think mm -hmm. that you can take it away. Mm -hmm. But my response to this singular instance 
is completely contingent upon my read of you as a player and how you're likely to respond to this new information. Right. And would you say then that you've been able to, the reading players and their tendencies, I mean, did you capture this, I guess, kind of intuitively over playing so many hands, or did you use some systems to go back and learn from, pre, you know, from hands and games that, of poker that you played? How, how did how did you develop a level of confidence around? Like, I know that this this type, or I know that th- these are the patterns that I would I would expect to see in this type of situation. Yeah, I, I mean. It, it comes over a long period of time. I mean, I've been yeah. doing this for 16 years, played yeah. millions of hands. Um, and so one aspect, obviously, is just when you play a lot of hands and you have an extremely tight feedback loop, like mm-hmm. I said, I can see what you had and I can see mm-hmm. was the hand that you had in the possibility set that I predicted, right? right? If it's in that set, it doesn't tell me something. But if it's outside of that set or that range, I know that one of my assumptions is incorrect. Mm-hmm. And so that acts as a kernel for me to dig into and right. try to try to identify where in the hand I misread. Right. Was it that you were playing a hand pre-flop that you I didn't think you would? Is it that you played the hand more aggressively or more passively than I thought? Right. Try to pinpoint where I went awry in my model. And um, this is this is all happening in real time. Mm. Um, There's there's a great deal of off the table study that occurs. Right. When I talked about poker is an 80 hour a week job, Mm. only 40 hours of that is actually playing. The other 40 hours of it is studying primarily in databases. Mm. So, um, you know, being online, uh, everything is, you know, stored. Uh, you can go back and view hands at any time. Right. And so if I have any time I have a hand where I'm not sure where the correct move is, I, I save it and I, and I analyze it off the table. Right. So these days, not only are there statistical tools where I can look at population level data and see how do people play this spot on average. That's usually a good place to start. Um, There are also machine learning tools Mm. where you can play the hand out against um, an algorithm that simulated this, you know, brute force, millions and millions of hands and see what is the game theory optimal approach, right? And usually the right answer will be somewhere in the middle. And, and really, I think that's the key to all decision making, right? It's People talk about this in investing as like a decision journal is any decision mm. you make, you're noting down what are the assumptions that are behind this decision at the time, right? Every decision you're making with incomplete information, right? Where mm-hmm. are the gaps? What are the plate? What's the value of information is any information I could have that would change my decision, noting that down at the time. And then later, when you have the ability to be objective, right, you're a little bit more separated from it and say, like, what could I have known at the time, which would have changed the way that I made that decision? Mm. And that's just a continual iterative process. Yeah, that's that's very cool. So uh, a couple of directions I I want to go here. And one is let's talk a bit about decision making. Let's talk a little bit about how some of these concepts apply to non-poker type of decisions, business decisions, investment decisions, personal decisions, etc. I want to go there. But the other thing I want to just explore a little bit, because you know, you have you, you discuss an 80 hour a week job. And I'm curious about what, you know, to get into the top 20 of online poker players, I, I'm assuming, you know, you have to do a lot of things that other players just aren't doing. And I, I, I presume that some aren't going to put those 80 hours in. But what, what are some of the things that you learned, uh, aside from, I guess, putting in putting that, that time, those hours that um, about, you know, high performance that you were also able to apply to your other pursuits? Uh, so many. Um, okay. I'll, I'll let's just, talk. Uh, let's talk about a few. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, first, the one that's really poker specific and that connects, obviously, is that, you know, peak performance comes from a match of doing the right things. Mm-hmm. And so thinking about that in like founder market terms of you are you are you are playing the right game. And that there are things that we are uniquely suited for that look like running up a wall to others and finding ways to double down in those areas. And so, I mean, that's that's a key to peak performance, which 
you know, seems a little bit typological is identify the areas that you have an advantage where you perf- already perform well and look for ways to lean into those areas. I, I believe that that very strongly. And so, you know, a key to becoming the best for me was only playing in the games that I could be the best. Right. Um, there's a there's a critical balance there, right? You need to be playing against better players to sharpen the game, um, to sharpen your own game. But knowing where your edge comes at any given time, right? That's that's the one that is the one thing that separates the players who are very talented from the players who make a ton of money is the players who make the most money play in the best games. Mm. You know where your edge is at any given time. I think an, a main, another thing that, that really separated me was just self-awareness and discipline. Mm-hmm. So I think that our level of performance is very dynamic. And so having a, a high level of introspection to know when you have it on a particular day and when the, you know, when's the time to go after it to back up the truck. Think about it this in terms of psychological capital mm-hmm. that you're really dialed in to recognize that those moments and to to go after them. And at the same time to notice to note the days that you don't have it, that you're not making good decisions and to limit your downside and to prioritize recovery because a, a, a poor decision wipes out a lot of really good mm. decisions and the results of any given day really don't matter. I, and then I, I would kind of transition there into just general peak performance, which is having the right habits, systems, and removing bottlenecks to resources, which I usually define as time, energy, and attention. Um, and I'll just kind of do like a high level overview of each of those yeah, five. Um, so I, I have a, I have a free workbook, um, which anyone wants to download. Um, it's at the forcing function.com slash workbook where I have, uh, prompts and experiments that are designed to install these into your life with all my recommendations. Um, so feel free to check that out. Um, I see, I see the weapons that we have for peak performance. It all comes down to systems and habits. Mm-hmm. So systems can we support what we want to do? So we have things that we're trying to accomplish. Do we have things in place that support us? And a lot of this comes down to measurement. We have something we're trying to achieve and we know day after day whether we're making progress on it. Um, it's the classic, you improve what you measure. Um, I love the you know the definition um, from how to measure anything that we measure to reduce uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And the more certainty or confidence we have in what we're doing, the faster we can sprint forward. So having these systems in place that we have the confidence that we're making improvements day after day. And hopefully that's something that comes across when I, you know, even if some of the, the examples from poker might be a little bit abstract in terms of that's really what allowed me to create distance between myself and the field was that every decision I made Um, every decision where I was wrong became an opportunity to improve. Mm -hmm. And it was that, it was that continuous improvement that allowed me to pass up other players. It's like, I didn't have as much natural ability, but I worked harder than them in the lab. The other half of that is your own behavior is habits is almost all on a daily basis of the decisions and behaviors that we do are habitual. You know, we talked about this in a poker context when people tend to follow follow the same patterns, right? When we're in the same situation, we tend to take the same action. And so the mm. two avenues we have to counter that are one, we change our context, or our environment, right? We put ourselves in a context or environment that's more supportive of what we want ourselves to do. The classic is if you want to stop drinking, don't go to the bar, right? Pick a mm. context that's a little bit more supportive of what you want to do. The, the avenue that I also like to attack is can I relink these associations I have with certain thought patterns, with certain behaviors, mm. with thought patterns and behaviors that are more beneficial? So having these principles in place that that offsource a lot of this decision making cognitive overload so that I can make the right decision on average more often. And then, you know, systems in place that support it in terms of I'm, I'm regularly reflecting and saying uh, the way that I'm making decisions supportive of my overall goals. Um, these are the things that I work with and clients to put in place to ensure that they're making progress every day, because that's really the key is to have this really long term um, time preference. 
And then, you know, the resources we have as an executive, um, I usually think of these in terms of unit of exchange and that I'm trying to exchange, you know, one unit for two units is Hmm. time, energy and focus. Right. Right. Can I convert one unit of time for two units of focus? Right. So high level time is am I working on the right things? Most people think in terms of can I work more hours or can I be more efficient? But the highest leverage point for time is just working on the things that are most important, putting a value, um, you know, monetarily, if possible, on all the things that you do and do more of the things that are a thousand dollars an hour and less of the things that are ten dollars an hour. It's as simple as that. It's like arbitrage. You know, secondarily, attention. I think a lot of success in things that are, you know, very decision oriented is being very present to be able to ramp up intensity when the situation calls for it. And usually that comes from constraints and elimination of distractions. And so being attuned to the things that are not a top priority and putting your blinders on so that you don't see them. Finally is energy. I mean, and this was something that um, was really kind of a call to Jesus moment for me as I looked at all the other poker players and, you know, they were eating typical pizza and sandwich right, diets. Right. Or they were staying up till 8 a.m., uh, going out and partying, like really bad posture, not exercising, hmm. um, you know. And then you would see this because, you know, you're playing poker, you know, 12 plus hours that the pack starts to separate once you get to that 8 to 12 hour mark where the guys who have poor energetic habits they tend to make poor decisions and they, mm. they chalk it up to getting unlucky, but it's that they just didn't have it anymore, right? They ran out of gas. And so I looked at, you know, there was a point in time early in my poker career, I was eating a whole pizza and drinking a two liter of pop and going, you know, that soda for those of you guys <laughs> in the UK. Um, you know, going, Fizzy to drinks. Bed Fizzy I, drinks. Yeah. going to bed whenever I, whenever I felt like it. And yeah. I realized, wow, like I need to, if I want to perform like a cognitive athlete, I need to treat mm. myself as a physical athlete. Mm. And so that having a consistent schedule where I'm waking up and doing the things that put myself in the best possibility to succeed, getting a great night's sleep, exercising every day, eating the right things that make me feel good. Um, all of these things, these little things really add up to being able to perform. And so, yeah, I was fortunate in that I had a large financial incentive where if I did not do these things, it was very obvious on the bottom line. And through that process was able to identify some things that generalized to knowledge workers, to investors that they put these same things into place in their own lives. They perform better. They make better decisions and it shows up on the bottom line. I love that. Uh, particularly around that the likening it to you know you're you're a cognitive athlete right and i think people that are listening to this many of them are in knowledge work or intellectual work and i keep saying to most of the people either on this podcast or people i speak to that we often in the work that we do in knowledge work that we sometimes separate the sort of you know, mind-body connection, but we shouldn't. And we should integrate those two things because if you, as you say, sleep right, you eat right, you're going to perform better. And it sounds obvious, but you know, you just walk around mo- many offices around the world and these things are treated as they're as entirely separate things. And it's, I, I, I love how you talk about getting an edge through better discipline of in terms of treating yourself like a like an athlete it's so so much comes down to you know cultivating a sensitivity and awareness you know the more sample size we have Mm -hmm. we can identify the patterns and so you talked about a mind-body connection um you know when i'm playing a hand sometimes you know i'll notice i'm sitting a certain way you know i've leaned Mm -hmm. in versus i've leaned back or i have a twinge in my neck or i start to get you know, soar in a certain area. And like all of these things are sources of information Mm -hmm. that we can try to calibrate over time. But it it requires cultivating this awareness in the first place. And I I think that's a big part. We've talked about feedback loops a little bit. I think a big part of why feedback loops are so critical to improvement is that we become aware of where things stand. 
and thus our attention is drawn to, right? I, I call this a forcing function. We we draw our consciousness to ways that we can improve this number. But without this awareness, right? Without l- taking a hard look at things, we aren't aware of opportunities to improve because we aren't aware that we need to improve in the first place. Mm-hmm. When you were trying to optimize your performance as a poker player, where did you look for some of these insights that your competitors weren't looking? Because all of this stuff you you know is available to to people. It come it comes from psychology, comes from all types of other sources. But uh, where, where did you go for you know, this type of edge? Uh, I've made it a habit to look at peak performers in tangential fields mm-hmm. and try to identify things that they're doing that might be worth trying. Um, I think it's a, you know, as an investor, you're looking at things that can work in one market and can be imported to Mm -hmm. another market. So I was looking at, you know, professional video gamers. Mm -hmm. I was looking at chess grandmasters. Um, I think there's a lot of literature from the military that's very Mm -hmm. useful. Um, Where where else? Um, Believe it or not, you know, I think a lot of decision making is, you know, process orientation. So um, some of the kind of manufacturing theory of constraints work is very useful. Um, Chefs, I think, I think if you look at Michelin star level chefs, um, they're more process oriented than just about anyone. I've taken a lot from there. Really, it's just looking at everyone as a potential expert. Mm. Um, You know, some areas, um, even now, I don't consider myself to be super knowledgeable, but I'm fortunate enough to have someone in my network who specializes there. So I'm not shy about asking them questions or even bringing them on as a partner when necessary. Mm -hmm. Cool. This is uh, all really great stuff. There's a wonderful study i think it was in i think it was maybe an article maybe not not as much as a study but there's a piece that i quite like that's been around for a while now but it's uh, i think the title is manage your energy not your time which um Mm -hmm. is what you you know exactly what you talk about i love the concept of arbitraging those resources that makes a lot of sense really interesting to look at the world that way there's a lot that i think my listeners can take away from from some of the stuff and the things that you describe in your your free book which actually i looked at and has has got loads of great stuff in it so really cool could we talk about decision making and what you've learned and how what you tell your clients about decision making that you've you've learned from the poker space Mm. all right i um One thing that comes to mind, I like this idea of continuums. And so one continuum that I'm in favor of is confident on one end and critical on the other end, right? So fully confident decision making is I am completely sure that I am right and I am never going to second guess myself. Okay. And, you know, this is just this is just what I'm doing. And the critical end of the continuum is I'm not really sure I need to look into this more. I want to ask others. Um, and usually uh, both being aware at any, any given time where you stand on that continuum is useful, but also when it can be useful to go to the extremes. Um, so this is a big thing that I talk about in Experiment Without Limits is you have experimental periods. Mm -hmm. Uh, A huge huge problem that that we have with decision making where it can become very willpower draining and Mm -hmm. cause us to get stuck is that we are never 100% sure about anything. And if you're waiting to be 100% sure, you're waiting too long because the way that we gain the most information is by experience. And so I'm trying to come up with models that allow me to quickly make a decision because most decisions generally are pretty low risk. A lot of things are are reversible or you can course correct at any given time, but then have systems in place that allow me to regularly reflect on that. So I'll get, I'll give a, a more tangible example. So this could be, you know, a marketing channel, right? You're, you're, there's three different marketing channels that you want to pursue. So for, for, you know, sake of example, let's say it's all right, we, we could do some direct mail, we can do Facebook, we can do cold call. And there's pros and cons to all of these different options. Um, I have a, uh, 
a spreadsheet where you can, you know, play with the numbers a little bit if you want to link to that in the show notes, um, mm-hmm. the forcingfunction.com slash EVC, Bell's Expected Value Calculator. Mm-hmm. Um, and the power of this exercise is that you actually identify which of the criteria are most important or the crux, right? What does this decision rest upon? There's usually one factor above the others that comes to be importance. And by recognizing that factor, you can see where you have the most uncertainty, where you would be, you would find it the most beneficial to test some of those assumptions. Putting that aside for, for the second, you use a model like this to choose, all right, well, all three of these options are pretty good, but based on what we know right now, let's say the direct mail seems the most promising. Mm-hmm. And the worst case scenario, you see this in tons of organizations, is that they start with the, they start down this path, but the whole time they're second guessing themselves like, oh, well, we haven't really had any results yet. Maybe we should have gone with Facebook after all. Mm-hmm. But that's the power of these experimental periods is you say, all right, for the next quarter, the next 90 days, we are going to act as if we are 100 percent confident that direct mail is the absolute best marketing channel for us. And we are going to sprint head first and say, how can we get the most out of this channel? And what that allows for is at the end of the 90 days, you have this this debrief where you're looking back and say, well, what did we learn from that? These assumptions that we had in the beginning, you know, how close were they? Um, And essentially we say, do we want to double down or try a different option? But by having that closed period where you're going to sprint and be on the fully confident part of the spectrum, knowing you're gonna have a designated point where you're gonna be fully critical and decide does it make sense to change completely, it allows you to fully explore the consequences of your decision and extract all the value that you can. Right. Where you know the key to decision making is, you know, make the best decision you can with the inf- information mm-hmm. you have and just proceed accordingly. So that's, I mean, that's something that I talk a lot about with my clients is kind of walking them through these big decisions, but also just putting the infrastructure in place that allows them to course correct at the right time rather than continually course correcting when it's not necessary. Okay. So supposing you had a a client that is thinking about what you just described here as a big decision. So it could be, you know, a, a merger or a divestment or something that's really the stakes are high you get it wrong and the the the, the impact could be quite severe so uh, ex- expected value calculator uh, you know understand that uh, however sometimes it's it's we, we might be constrained in terms of our ability to experiment what are some of the kind of gen- generic steps or questions you might ask about about the decision to help your client make make that decision in the highest quality way Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to identify what are the invalidated assumptions. Mm-hmm. Um, so essentially, where is the most uncertainty? Mm-hmm. Um, any, any, you know, complicated decision where there's a bunch of intangibles can essentially be reduced down to some form of calibrated estimates of what do we know and where do we not know very much mm-hmm. and trying to get those within some sort of range. And as I said, I think I think the goal of making any decision is trying to identify what are the factors that really matter, right? Mm-hmm. We talked about this early on in terms of signal versus noise and that more information is not necessarily better because it can, it can be right. irrelevant and we can get mm-hmm. buried in things that aren't actually part of the regression analysis. You know, they don't actually contribute to mm-hmm. what the factors that matter. And so identifying where we have the most uncertainty, identifying what are the assumptions that the model hinges upon, and ideally trying to create some sort of experiment to reduce that uncertainty, which maybe this means going to someone in a different department and sitting down with them. Um, maybe this means you know, doing some sort of customer analysis. Um, you know, Generally, any sort of big decision uh, where corporations go awry is they take the inside view versus the outside view. Usually there's mm. some, you know, Everything that's occurred has happened in sim- some similar form before. So you said a merger, right? Let's look at all mergers that are of this type, you know, taking our unique snowflake situation aside and say, how have these mergers performed on average? The ones that went mm-hmm. wrong, why did they go wrong? Are there any factors that we can recognize here? It's like once you take things 
you know, to the outside view, make it a little bit more objective and say, in general, how do these mergers perform? You kind of get get the ego out of it. It al- it allows people to be, to be a little bit more objective, and it mm-hmm. tends to make these these ranges of estimates a little bit more compressed. Mm-hmm. You can work with them a little bit more. So yeah, it's it, every I think everyone here is familiar with kind of like the Fermi calculations, right? Where you can but you can you can reduce down. Uh, it's, this originally arose to is like what are the chances that there is life in out of space? Right. And we say okay, well there's there's these number of galaxies and each galaxy has this mm. number of stars this each star is this number of planets and each planet has this percentage chance of being hospitable to life and each time that life has sprouted you know it has made it past the great filter and hasn't destroyed itself etc cetera, etc cetera. where you can you can take something that's incre- feels incredibly complicated and reduce it down to a series of things that are actually pretty easy to estimate and are relatively known and so yeah that's that's kind of what I would try to guide them through is that that deconstruction process. Yeah, that's that's really cool. And I believe that similar techniques can be used for, you know, personal decisions, right? That our signal to noise ratio is pretty high nowadays, which is the, the, I think that's where a lot of people struggle with decisions in their in their personal lives. But I would you would you similarly advocate a technique along those lines? As far as, you know, cultivating your information diet? Yeah. Yeah. So for example, maybe the decision is, should I, you know, should I move and accept an opportunity in another country or uh, something, you know, something along those lines, right? Now you've got a lot of other factors in terms of maybe people in your life to consider you, 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 there's a lot of incomplete information. There's a lot of, there's a lot of noise in terms of what um what you might be expected to do there's a there's a there's a lot of online information that could be quite distracting and and so how would you go about making a decision that might be related to a you know personal uh, lifestyle choice for example and yeah, I feel like I, I might be repeating myself. But okay, maybe that's a good thing, okay. and that, and that uh, the, the methodology is similar because yeah. uh, you know the expected value calculator. I um, I referenced earlier. That's how I've decided. You know, every city that I've moved to, okay. every position that I've taken, it's pretty it's pretty nimble there. Yeah. Um, and it's essentially, the process is the same in that you're trying to identify what the critical factors are and gather more information on that critical factor to, you know, validate your assumptions a little bit. Yeah. And so let's say, let's say, you know, in that scenario you gave, you know, moving to a new city and taking a new job, right? You would need to break those apart a little mm-hmm. bit. You know, generally any any dichotomy is a false dichotomy. It's like, well, let's think about the job separately from the move. Right. Um, you know, it's like in the uh, I'm also, again, this is it, whenever possible, try to form some sort of experiment where you can quickly gather data. Yeah. I mean, in startup terms, this is the classic MVP, right? Yeah. Don't go out there and spend $100 million on a product before you've you know, yep. validated it at the market. Come up with the crappiest possible thing that you can at least see, like, am I thinking about this problem in the right way? Does this problem exist and are people willing to pay? So, I mean, the example that you've given, I'll just use a, I'll use a personal example that will hopefully be illustrative. So, you know, when I decided to move to New York for the first time in 2012, I had never actually been here. I mean, New York was kind of an abstraction to me. But, you know, I made a spreadsheet of the different places in the U.S. that I wanted to live and New York came out on the top. And so I did what any rational person would do is I booked a flight for the next day and got an Airbnb for a month. And like I said, with the experimental period, uh, I was you know, operating on the assumption for that month that I now live in New York and I'm going to act as if I now live in New York. And at the end of the month, I'll see if I want to stay or stick around or try somewhere else. And, you know, luckily it's been a huge fit. I mean, I'm, I'm incredibly happy here. Every day is super interesting and fulfilling, but had the 30 days not gone as planned, I would have been, okay, well, what's option number two? Let's Mm -hmm. try that. And I think the power there is you, we take these, these big decisions which there's so many unknowns and it's much easier than we think 
to test some of those unknowns mm-hmm. and you know decompose what seems like a large decision into smaller component decisions. Um, so whenever possible, you know, trying to construct these experiments in order to test, um, that's that's my average recommendation. Love it, love it. That's great stuff. I also wanted to talk about overcoming setbacks because obviously that happens in the game of poker. I presume there are you know loads of lessons that you gathered and that are applicable to all types of you know the, the non-poker world and the work that you do with the forcing function. Could you talk a little bit about some strategies that you have employed when say a hand doesn't go your way and you know just something just goes wrong and and, and what do you do to to overcome that and bounce back? Yeah, it's it's something that I think about a lot, right? It's you know, as a, as a poker player, you're you're essentially professionally getting punched in the face over <laughs> and over again yeah. um, because you know, short term results are incredibly noisy, and you can mm. play very well, and the results can go against you, mm-hmm. especially if you're playing tournaments or in the live arena. It's not it's not uncommon for a winning player to go you know months or over a year of losing but you know still making good decisions and you know obviously built into that is many times you know bad luck leads to bad decisions that you know we have a hard time maintaining discipline when things are going against us um and so you know reduces down to i think you know our biggest bottleneck once you reach a certain stage of freedom is you know what gets you out of bed in the morning and you know when you've when you've lost six figures at the poker table, it, sometimes it can be difficult. And that's where habits are really key. I talk about this in the habits and routines chapters, you know, having the things in place where you're continually going through the motions as if like today is going to be a great day and I'm today is going important. So I need to set myself up for success. Keeping up with those routines, continuing to go through the motions goes a long way for you know, preventing yourself from digging yourself into a hole. Mm-hmm. Um, I talk about this as well in the uh, the mental game chapter in the context of a fire break. So um, if anyone has ever seen, you know, firefighters dealing with a large forest fighter, um, the technology hasn't changed in thousands of years. Essentially, you dig a hole around the fire. And so if it's, you know, a giant forest fire like the ones happening in California, you're digging a very large circled hole. And the same thing applies to our own lives is, you know, whenever we have a big setback, we we dig a hole around it, right? We create a fire break so that we prevent the damage from spreading. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, the habits that I've found really beneficial for getting back on the horse are you know some form of journaling you know writing about it getting things out of their head out of your head where it's always less intimidating uh gratitude you know doing anything you can to reaffirm to yourself just all the blessings you have in your life people you know situation etc um and then finally like using it as an opportunity to improve right seeing seeing what you extract in terms of lessons from it um and identifying you know ways to move forward um as part of you know regular review process which is a habit as well i I always like to keep kind of a, a list of activities that you know make me feel good that inspire me that kind of get me going and you know whenever i've had a setback I prioritize doing these things that, you know, self-care is not selfish, that, you know, my top priority becomes getting myself back up to a, to a position of peak performance. Um, you know, this is true as a poker player where, you know, your hourly rate is dynamic. If you're, if you're playing your B game, you're losing money and you're better off staying in bed and sleeping, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, it's, it's an important thing to internalize and it happens often as an executive is if you're not performing, do what you can to get yourself back into a position that you're performing because not only are you not doing yourself any favors, you're costing yourself, right? You'd be better mm. off just staying home. And it's an important thing to internalize that recovery is something that should be prioritized when you've had a setback. But a, a lot of that comes to, you know, both having those habits in place, trusting the system. And when you have the setback, having the discipline to do the things that you know will make you feel better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, all great advice, really good stuff. I'd like to talk a little bit more about your the forcing function and uh, the work that you do. And in terms of that work, have you 
gotten to a point where you've got sort of a, I guess, a large enough sample size of think about maybe entrepreneurs and small business owners of, of areas that your clients that you see struggle with more than others. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think assuming someone has reached a, a stage of, let's say productivity and that they can reliably have, you know, level of consistent output day after day, right? Having mm-hmm. some routines and habits and systems in place, you know, that that's, that's kind of the, the first milestone. Um, and, you know, that, that can be varying levels of messiness, right? If mm. having worked with some of the, in my opinion, most successful executives in the world, like a lot of them would kind of refer to themselves as procrastinators or disorganized or mm-hmm. unproductive, but they still manage to get shit done when they need to. So, the, you know, the assumption is, you know, someone has reached this point. If not, you know, solidifying habits and systems is always, is always the first step. Um, the commonality at that point that I see is just a failure to plan and prioritize. I, I think that hopefully this has become, you know, a theme throughout the day is like I see our lives as this continuous feedback cycle and that we plan, right? What do we want to do? Why is that important? How are we going to do it? And then we execute or in my words, experiment. We run head first on what we think the best plan of attack is. And we collect data so that we can see that when we finally three reflect, you know, what did we learn? Was that the right move? Should we have done something different? Like, what could we have known at the time that would change that decision? And that reflection gets fed back into the plan and create and completes mm-hmm. the loop. And so I, I see a lot of otherwise very high performing executives missing two critical parts of that loop and that. They're not planning out their days, their weeks, Mm -hmm. as far as what are the top things that they need to be prioritizing, the classic important but not urgent things. Mm -hmm. They tend to get sucked into the reactive, the things that are deadline driven that are being pulled out of them. And they're, they're not taking the time to regularly reflect on what's working and what's not working. Really, it comes down to working smarter, not harder. And that's that that's a framing of the conversations that I have with a lot of executives, which frankly, feels like cheating sometimes. And that the question is, hey, you said, uh, you know, for example, your priorities for this month were, you know, hiring, raising money and finding a new product line. And I look at your calendar and you're spending, you know, 10, 15 and 5 percent of your time on those on those three things. Mm -hmm. So like, are they not your priorities? You know, Mm -hmm. if they are, why are you only spending 30 percent of your time on them? And I always like the portfolio analogy is the nice thing about tracking where your time is going is you just recognize, oh, well, that's interesting. The things that are my priority, I'm not actually spending that much time on. You can rebalance your portfolio so your schedule becomes a little bit more in alignment with what you said is a priority. And, you know, that's, again, a continuous iterative process. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you say that a lot of you know top executives don't do that. Because I think we all struggle to do that. But it's interesting that you say the top executives sometimes or often don't do that. that that's what you that's what you see. I guess you're, you're trying to help certain people get that that edge, that that sort of one to three percent performance improvement that could be quite transformative. Yeah. And I mean, they're still getting things done because Mm -hmm. they do what it takes to get the things done. Mm -hmm. And it shows up insidiously in other parts of their lives where, again, like success is very, you know, personally, subjectively driven. Like some of the people who we think is the most successful, we wouldn't necessarily change places with them because of the trade offs and sacrifices they've had to made. And unfortunately for some of these guys, it shows up in poor health lots of stress. Um, they don't get to see their family or kids as much as they would like. Mm -hmm. They don't really have outside hobbies. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're constantly sprinting. And as we were talking about with the poker players who fade on hour 10, you kind of see this in terms of burnout. And a lot of them go on sabbatical or take a break or (laughs) don't reach the levels that they could. And so, you know, I'm very big on, you know, let's create some hard stops and how can you get all the things you need to done and, and still leave the office at 5 p.m. to go see your friends and family Mm -hmm. and kite surf and do the things that you love. And being effective 
is very different than getting the things done. And so having these right systems in place where you're spending the time on the priorities, it allows you to have time for the other things to recharge so that the things that actually matter, you're able to show up fully. Cool. Right. We've uh, we've covered a lot of ground and I know that you've got a, a stop coming up. I know you're in Davos recently, and I'm just just curious what that was like, and what you uh, what you learned at Davos this year, what you think of the whole Davos thing. Oh uh, man, I'm still consolidating the lessons. I, ju- I just got okay. back uh, yesterday. Um, you know, the, my reason, my interest in going is, you know, I'm always I'm always looking at the bleeding edge, and I'm curious, you know, what the top people are doing. So you have, you know, some of the top executives, investors, all converging on this tiny ski town in the middle of winter, and I'm just curious why, and I want to <laughs> peek behind the curtain and see what can be gleaned. Uh, what are these guys doing that we can learn from? Um, and it is very, it was very interesting for me to see. We were talking about stories earlier, the amount of tension, attention that um, these executives have put into story, mm-hmm. the stories that they're telling about the companies they're in and the stories that they're telling about their own personal brand and their place within mm-hmm. those companies. And it made me feel a little bit self-conscious at times of, wow, I could use some some work on crafting my own story. But then you realize, hey, this is what you know, these guys sit on these panels and go to these, uh, you know, world series of networking type events professionally. And so, you know, seeing this as not a setback, but an opportunity that, hey, here's here's how high the potential can go. Right. Here's 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 where you can be if you, you know, some of these guys are you know 30 years into their career. Like this is this is the North Star that you can shoot for as far as. Yeah, I'm just learning. Just yeah, on that point, like I'm, I'm a little bit wary of of stories. I know it's important to when you're trying to explain your yourself, your company, your brand, whatever to other people. It's incredibly important to have stories because we listen to story. The way we listen to stories is hardwired into our brains, and so we can kind of retain that information. But mm-hmm. in terms of studying high performers, one of the challenges I have with stories is that the the stories that get told are the ones after success happens and so you you're not necessarily yeah. getting oh, yeah. all the information and you have this sort of survivor bias thing going on that you all of a sudden you think that you know, what you should be doing is doing a proper kind of control study of successful companies and individuals and you can then distinguish the factors so i always have this yeah, I love hearing some of these inspirational kind of stories of, of of leaders, but at the same time, I'm I'm skeptical. So I don't know if you have a, just as a you know very analytical thinker, what you what you make of all of that. One hundred percent, I'm on the same page. I, I always talk about be careful about overgeneralizing from a single example mm-hmm. because you know it's very hardwired into us to have this narrative bias, and you know it's like I've I've kind of made a living on capitalizing on that. Mm. And my 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 point is that there these guys are professional storytellers and especially when you have, you know, 30 seconds in front of someone to make that classic elevator impression, mm-hmm. having something packaged in the right way where you're memorable, they can tell at a glance you know, what you do, what you're about, um, in a word, you know, legibility, right? You're, you're understood for what, for what the, the brand you're trying to convey. That's what I mean in terms of skill. Mm. Now, do I take any of that at face value? I mean, certainly not. And it's, it's something that I think a lot about because I mean, as maybe a listener from this conversation could tell, I think the truth is much more nuanced than can be explained in a single, single example. But the, the simple truth is like this is the way that you know connections are made that people take in lessons and so to neglect the the fabric of the way that we you know find meaning in the world doesn't doesn't seem like the right approach either right. um and yeah and like in the you know the classic biographies the uh you know what it takes you know yeah. what i learned on my way to the top not necessarily the best source of information I always try to go to the source. And so that was my idea of going is I had all of these preconceived notions of what happens in these places. And I thought there would be a lot to learn by using my own eyes and ears. 
Yeah, super interesting. Just as you were talking as well, it's also important not to fully buy into one's own narrative as well, which I think can also happen in these <laughs> cases, right? Yep. Cool. Any other thoughts from the, the Davos experience that uh, you uh, you took away? Hmm. Yeah, so many. It's uh, I would say one that comes to mind is I hope some of these narratives converge into action. There was a lot of common vocabulary or in parlance buzzwords that, you know, a lot of passwords being exchanged back and forth. And, you know, the truth is, is, is sometimes if this narrative gets changed, it generates bottom up demand that actually catalyzes action. And that was the thing that I'm, you know, I'm hoping to see is, you know, do we've talking about story a lot today is, you know, do these stories, if repeated enough, you know, alter reality? Do mm. they lead to a difference in behavior? And that the jury is still out for me is like, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm skeptical. But it is it was very interesting to see how this convergence upon narrative has the potential, at least to push some of these things that require, you know, global level coordination forward. And that part of coordination is common vocabulary, common narrative. Why are we all in this, in this together? The classic sapiens, right? We need to converge upon the same myth in order to coordinate our efforts. Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of cool to see that happening at the top level. And I'm curious to see, you know, how that percolates downward. Yeah, very cool. All right. This was Awesome, Chris. I want to be respectful of your time. So we, uh, I feel like I can keep talking to you for, for quite some time, but we probably need to wrap up. Before we do, where can people find you, follow you, learn more about the work that you do, all of that great stuff? I mean, Ben, I, I can't begin to describe how enjoyable this was. And so, yeah, thank you for, for being an excellent partner and for you know giving me the space to explore some of these ideas. Absolute pleasure. Um, if things I said today were interesting, you know, would love to continue this conversation online. Um, you know, give you a couple ideas of you know next steps you can do. So first, you know, I mentioned uh, my workbook called Experiment Without Limits. Um, that's free to download on my website, theforcingfunction.com/workbook. I mentioned, you know, if you have an int if you have a big decision coming up, a framework that I love, it's a editable spreadsheet that you can kind of customize to your own needs um, that I call the expected value calculator. That's at theforcingfunction.com slash EVC. I'd also recommend I have something that I call the performance assessment. You know, we're talking about signal and noise today with all the stuff that's out there as far as improving your performance, your decision making. It's, it's difficult to know where to begin. Um, and so this is a free quiz that I created that you could take on my website and it'll give you recommendations on how to improve your own performance and decision making. So that's the forcingfunction.com slash assessment. I'm pretty easy to get a hold of on all the major social media platforms. Uh, my handle there is at Sparks Remarks. Fantastic. Chris, this was awesome. Thank you very, very much and uh, wish you all the best. I, I love your work. I love your approach to things and I'm sure my listeners are going to get a lot out of this. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you. All right. I hope you enjoyed Chris and a huge thank you to him for recording this and being patient with its release. Links are in the show notes as usual. Thank you all for being with us. We will be back soon with a guest that I consider to be very, very special. Stay tuned for that. Until then, and as always, don't forget, risk is life.